Hallelujah. Well, we're going to get in the Word, but I need your help. You don't need any of my opinions. They just got me in trouble. You need to hear past me and hear God. I need to hear Him every day, and you do too. We don't want to waste any time being religious today. This is not a nice little church service. This is an opportunity for us to spend 30, 45 minutes literally in the throne room. The Bible says we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And we can find help in time of need. And we can receive mercy if we need it. So does anybody need any help from God today? Amen. Me too, bud. Let's get it. Father, we come to you, sir, in the holy name of Jesus. Lord, I ask you for a fresh anointing today for my brothers and sisters, for me to deliver your word, your truth. And Father, I thank you for a door of utterance opened unto us in and by your Holy Spirit. I ask you to reveal yourself, grant us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the intimate knowledge of God. And my master will be very careful to give you all the glory and the honor for it. Oh, God, you're so good, sir. Lord, I pray that, that you would reveal how good you are to everybody, how much you love them. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. You know, the Bible says there's only two ways to live. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, it says we walk by faith and not by sight. And that's, that's all that's available according to God. We either live our lives all day, every day, every decision we make, every time we're confronted with we have to make a decision uh, look, according to the word. We either are going to do it we're going to lean on our own understanding. We're going to use our intellect and our comprehensive and our analytical skills and all. We're going to decide what we think is best, and we're going to do that. Or we're going to filter everything that we think of, every word we say, every action we take, and every reaction we make. We're going to filter that through what did God say? Is this the truth, or is this just a good book? Because you've read a lot of books. Yeah, I've met a lot of people, man. I mean, Elvis, uh, the night that I met him, I mean, the night that he decided to sing my song, he came to my concert. I, later on, years later, I got to go to his. But he came to a concert where it was a gospel. He liked that kind of music. And uh, I was in the Army. I hitchhiked over to, uh, I got a weekend pass. I hitchhiked all Friday night, all day Saturday. Got into Memphis, Tennessee at 7.15 on Saturday night. And my parents were getting ready to go on stage at a concert, and I went out there and sung a song. My mom, I was 17. I just gotten out of high school. I was in the Army, and uh, they would draft you. In those. It was 1962. They'd draft you if you didn't join, so I knew they were going to cut my hair, which, which I think is rude. <laughs> so I, I joined up to get that over with. You know, I wanted to be in a band, so I, and I went over to Memphis, and Mama said, grab your daddy's guitar. I hadn't had a shower. I'd been hitchhiking all night. I got rained on a bunch of times. I mean, I hadn't had anything to eat. I just wanted to go to the hotel and go to sleep. She said, nope, get your daddy's guitar. I want you to sing that song you sung for me that I like. And so, you know, you're just a kid. Nobody listens to you. You're just a, I was five feet and four inches tall when I went to the Army. I weighed 119 pounds when I got out of high school and went to the Army. And uh, so... I was just a little guy all wet and disheveled, and I grabbed my daddy's guitar, and I sung this song without him. And Elvis was there. I didn't know he was there. He, was just, he had decided to make a gospel record. And so he sent for me afterwards and said, I like your song. And, I mean, you know, Elvis was the biggest star in the world in those days. And it wasn't anybody close in those days. He was big. And so it's cool to meet those kind of people. And for somebody, and, and later on, two of the Beatles played on one of my records. Ronnie Woods from the Rolling Stones played on one of my records. Cla Eric Clapton. Um, you know, we toured with this, the Who and the Stones. And, and, you know, it was a pretty amazing world to hang with the dead and the, and the Almond Brothers and you know, and Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and I don't know who you thought was cool. I thought James Taylor wrote some good songs. You know what I mean? And to get to hang out with those guys, that was amazing. But then 
the, think about this the word of in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and it goes on to say and all things were created by him not it the word of God him and without him was not anything made that was made. It goes on down to verse 14 of John 1, 1 and says that the, the word became flesh and dwelt among men. That's who Jesus is. We beheld the glory of the Son of God. In the beginning, before there was a Florida, there was the word of God. And God has written it down. It's a book, and, and it's not about God. It, it is, it'll tell you, it'll give you information about him, but it was a book written to you. And it's a book full of promises, over 7,000 promises. And according to him, he said, all these promises are yes and amen. You don't have to beg God to do them. If, if, if God tells you he'll save you, he'll save you. If you ask him to forgive you, he's never said no. He's never, you, you may have said no to some people, but God's never said no. His word is yes and amen. If you ask him to heal you, he will if you believe it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, Jesus uh, said to Jairus, he's the head of the synagogue, very religious guy, very powerful guy, very well respected in, in his neighborhood. But somebody was dying and he needed help. And Jesus said to him, they came to him later on and said, it's too late, don't bother the master anymore, she's dead. The one he had come there to get prayer for was already dead. And Jesus just looked at him and said, fear not, only believe. Death is not a problem. Cancer is not a problem. God gets rid of AIDS as easy as a headache. It's not a problem. The problem is, do you believe it? God, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro throughout the earth, and he's looking for somebody that he can stand strong on their behalf. Do, can I find somebody who believes me when the chips are down and the devil's saying it won't work? Because that's what's going on all day, every day. In the beginning, we were in the Garden of Eden. It was awesome. It was amazing. It was incredible. God, there, nobody had to work. There was no taxes. Come on, y'all. This is a cool place now. I mean, everything God does, you know, when I was a kid, my parents had this song. You know, my parents were gospel singers, and they sung this song. And sometimes people get religious, and they don't know it. The song went like this. I just want a little cabin in the corner of glory land. It was sort of a cool song. Only thing is, there ain't no cabins in the corner of glory land. In my father's house are many mansions. <laughs> And if it was not so, I'd have told you. I'd be straight with you. And by the way, those mansions, those babies are paid for. Ain't no mortgages on the streets of gold. That, come on now. God is not a cheapskate. You being blessed is not a problem for him. He's got plenty for you and everybody else. He's just got to find somebody that believes it. Because in the Garden of Eden... God hung out. The Bible says he created Adam and Eve because he wanted somebody to love them. He just wanted somebody to fellowship with. He wanted somebody to hang out with. And he fixed everything. Man, the, 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 the food was awesome. The water was clean. He made them the gods of this world. Adam and Eve were in total dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. If it crawled, if it ran, man... They were in total control. They had no problems because there was no sin. And then the liar came. The Bible says Satan is the father of all lies. He's the first one that, that started lying, and he's got it down to a fine sign. And he went to Eve, and you know, God had told him, he said, you know, I got this one tree, you can have every, it's all for you. I created this whole earth just for you. But there's one tree that's, it's my tithe. It belongs to me. And if you, you can eat anything in here, you can have anything in here, but you don't touch this one tree. If you eat the fruit of this tree, you will die. And all the devil said was, nope, you eat of that tree, you won't die. God's lying to you. You eat of that tree, and of course, you know, she ate of the tree. 
And then Adam, the Bible says Adam knew he wasn't deceived. Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't. He knew better than to do that, but he went with Eve instead of God. And that's when it got bad. I mean, the weather had been perfect. I, I was sitting and meditating on it one day. That's what the Bible says, do with the Word of God. And the weather, do you know how perfect the weather? They found out later on they were naked. That's cool. That's good weather if you don't even need a shirt. You know what I mean? A pair of britches. Come on, that's good weather, y'all. Everything was perfect in heaven, in, in the Garden of Eden. But when she went with the devil and went with the liar instead of God, and by the way, that's the problem today. It's exactly the same. Every day, every human being goes through the exact same thing. Every day, you're trying to believe the word of God, and then the devil comes on. He sets up these situations because now once sin came, Satan became the God of this world. And he's got a lot of people under his control, and a lot of them go to church. Now, I don't mean they're possessed. They're not because they're born again. I'm talking about they're still immature. And it's easy to trick kids. You know, people who grow up, not so much. But it's easy to deceive kids. And by the way, the Bible says some people deceive themselves. And what could be worse than that? If you hear the Word of God, it, for instance, the Word of God comes and says, forgive everybody. Jesus said this. If you don't forgive everybody of everything, it's Mark, the fourth chapter, 25th verse. He said, if you don't forgive everybody of everything, my Father won't forgive you. And yet there's people who come, how many times have you had somebody say to you, I tried to forgive them and I can't? I mean, it happens. It happens all the time. What that means is I tried and it didn't feel good and I'm still mad about it and I don't like the way you're being God, so don't tell me to forgive. I ain't doing it. So they're not forgiven. You know, you don't get to make your own deal. Jesus said, if you don't forgive everybody of everything, my Father won't forgive you. You can come down here and cry. You can be in the choir. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can negotiate, but you can't con God. He makes the rules. He, if, if I could tell him what to do, I'd be God. No, I'm mine. I do what I'm told. He's Lord. I'm definitely not. Amen? And he's your Lord if you obey him, if you do what you want to do and, and disobey him and ignore him, then you're your Lord. So then you're fighting the devil on your own. And now you see why so many Christians have so many problems. But when we submit to God and when we believe that God is honest, that means we don't have any doubts. That means when the devil says it won't work for you, we don't worry about that because we know it will. We don't know when there's a test. How many of you know, for instance, on your giving, the Bible says as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest. People say it like seed time is one word, but it's two. There'll be a time when you sow, and there'll be a time when you're waiting on the Lord. That's when the test comes. Now, harvest time's over there, and it's definitely guaranteed according to God. But between the time you sow and the time harvest time, you got to waiting on the Lord. Well, how long? It, you know, I prayed for healing. Why am I still having these symptoms? That's called the test. How do you pass the test? You don't fear and you don't doubt. You believe God is honest. Now, I hope that's not too complicated. It's a choice. You see, there's no, this is not a religious thing. This is a simple choice made by a human being. God has given us a free will, and he will not violate your will. If he was going to do that, he'd make everybody worship him. If God, people say, oh, God is in control. There used to be a song. I was a contemporary Christian musician, and there was a great song, and it was a really good song called God is in Control. The problem is he's not. He can be if he wants to be. He could take control any time. But he's given all of us a free will. If God was in control, that guy wouldn't have shot those people in El Paso last night. If God was in control, there wouldn't be anybody with a hangover this morning. They'd all be in church. Nobody would have hit their wife this week or, or all the crazy stuff that people do. God's given us a free will, and he will not violate. If God was in control, everybody would go to heaven. We know what his will is. His will says he wishes that none should perish, that all should have everlasting life. But everybody ain't going to heaven, are they? No, because they're making choices. People, lots of people think God's half a word. 
and they use that word to to curse each other and they they ignore God and dishonor him and those people have made their choices but the good news is we get to make ours and nobody can make us make the right decision but glory to God nobody can stop us the devil can't stop us we're free we're free in Jesus amen and when we choose to believe that God is honest we walk by faith and we do not lean on our own understanding. Walking by sight, all that means is we, we observe the circumstance, we think about it, and we decide with our own intellect. We lean on our own understanding. Jesus said, don't do that. He said, trust me. Let me filter your thoughts and your words and your actions and reactions. And that's the kingdom of God. Kingdom is a, the word kingdom is a contraction. It means the kingdom is wherever the king's in dominion. You know, if you were, you know, if you were, you know, six, seven hundred years ago, if you lived in England and the king of England was in dominion, that meant if he didn't like you, he could take your house away from you and give it to his cousin. Because he had total dominion. Nobody could tell him what to do. Well, Jesus, thank God, is a good king. And he doesn't hurt anybody. He helps everybody. Anybody that trusts him, their life gets better. And the more you give him to work with, I mean, if you just give him your sins, praise God, he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if you really want a good life, you need to give him the whole thing. You need to give him your hopes and dreams and your money and your relationships. I mean, the more you give him to work with, the better it'll get. But there'll be a test. How many of you know there will be a test? Let's look at uh, James. Um, let's look at James, the first chapter and verse 2 through 8 in the NIV, please. They're going to put it up for us. Uh, can you see that from back there? Cool. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. When you have trials of, whenever you face trials of many kinds, I, I have the Milan version of this verse is, when all hell breaks loose, rejoice. I remember the first time I read that, I was... 35 years old I'd been to church a lot when I was a kid but I only went because my daddy was bigger than me I didn't really want to be there and and uh, so I didn't get anything out of it and we sung about Jesus but I didn't read the Bible you know it was one of those big dusty books that always stayed on the same page at our house it was like a piece of furniture I don't know, it literally sat on its own podium thing looking thing and uh, so I'd never read the Bible and and when you read stuff like this for the first time, are you kidding? Rejoice when all this hard, intense, bad stuff is going on? It's just your brain won't do that. You know what I mean? When you're a new Christian, it's like turn the other cheek. When somebody slaps you, you just have to go to the next page. You're not going to get that for a while. Come back later. It'll make more sense. You know? Consider pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith do you guys un read do you take notes in church or do you underline things in your Bible you know I took every drug but birth control for 20 years so I have to write things down because I just have to write things down you know what I mean so but if you do I would put a line under this the testing of your faith the testing you know when you're in school how do you get promoted you pass the test and if you don't pass the test, it doesn't matter whether you blame it on the teacher. Well, he was just a bad teacher. It's okay. You're still in that same grade next year unless you pass the test. Now, you can go to a new school, but when you get over there, if you were in the fourth grade, guess what grade you're in over to new school? You can go to a new church. You can blame it on the pastor and some decision he made. You can blame it on your wife. You can get you a new wife. You can blame it on your mother-in-law. You know what I mean? You can blame it on the devil. or. Uh, but the bottom line is you're still in the fourth grade until you pass the test. And you can, you can say, God, I don't like this test. And, and you can blame it on God. You can blame it on, you know, God gets the blame for lots of stuff. But the bottom line is if you want your master's degree, you're going to have to pass some 
You know, when you're in kindergarten, you, you just got to keep the crayon inside the lines. The tests aren't that hard. Put the square block in the square hole. Come on, you, we can do it. But when you're getting, you know, into physics and calculus and, and you know, things get more intense and more the tests are more subtle. So the Bible says that to whom much is given. In other words, the more revelation that you get, the more that you understand who God is and how he does things, then more will be required of you. Too much is given, much is required. And that's a good thing. That's an excellent thing. You want to have to pass harder tests because that means you're getting somewhere with God. And man, that means you can help your family. That means you not only will make better decisions yourself and better choices yourself, but now you can help your co-workers and you can help your wife and children and you can, you can fix stuff that you didn't know what to do with. Amen? It says in verse th 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or patience, in other words. When it looks like it's not working, you'll still be standing because you'll be able to persevere. And that's the test. When it looks like and feels like it's not working, that's the test. You go to the doctor and the doctor finds something in your blood or in a CAT scan or something. Oh, man, this is, this is horrible stuff. And you're sitting there in the doctor's office and the doctor says to you, man, this is really dangerous and, and we don't know how long you got to live and blah, blah, blah. Here's what you need. If you're a believer, you'll be able to look that doctor right now and say, Doc, man, that's some bad stuff you found on that microscope. That'd kill an unbeliever. But since I'm not one, I want you to really document this good so that when the Holy One of Israel shows up in my house and his healing manifests, his presence in my body, then I'll be able to show my friends what the Lord has done, that Jehovah Rapha loves me so much that he made his word come true in my body. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. 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 That's what Pastor did. Let perseverance, verse 4, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. That's the will of God. Not lacking anything. Not lacking anything. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or lack for anything. Glory to God. That's the will of God. Amen. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives it generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to him or to you. Verse 6, but when you ask for anything, by the way, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And then this verse, this, this verse 7 here, I said in the first service, to me this is the scariest verse in the Bible. Let not that man or woman expect to receive anything from the Lord. Do you know how horrible that is? There are Christians who, who doubt God. They hope he's honest. They pray, but it's not, it's not expecting it to happen. That's what faith does. When you, God said, bring me in remembrance of my word. So if the doctor says you're sick and you say, God, you told me that you sent your word and healed me. You said in your words, we bring him in remembrance, that you, your word is life to those that find it and health to all their flesh. And I believe your word is health to my flesh. You said that you are the God that healeth me. And I believe that. You are Jehovah Rapha. You're my God. You're, amen. By his stripes I was, and therefore if I believe it, I still am healed. So you start reminding God what he said about his word, you reverse the curse. That's the whole purpose of having the Bible, so that we understand how this thing works. We live in a world that's cursed. It's chaotic because of sin. We are surrounded with sin. We're surrounded with unbelievers. If you watch TV, you go to a secular school, they're going to train you all about abortion and why it's important. They're going to they're going to pay for it if you'll, you know what I mean? They don't want to just make sin available. They want to make it acceptable. 
They'll train you all kind of stuff that has nothing to do with God. When I was a kid, they taught us we evolved from monkeys. And after observing some of my kin folks, I considered it possibility, you know. <laughs> Almost got me. Such a person is double-minded. Who's double-minded? Anybody that's not sure if God is honest. And you won't know until the test comes. You can't pass a test until you're being tested. Wouldn't it be cool if you could have a testimony without a test? But you can't. You, just, you could have a money. <laughs> but if you're going to have a testimony, the devil's got to come after you. And, he's, and he comes to steal and kill and destroy. He doesn't come to, be, to just give you a headache. He wants to kill you, man. He wants to steal your kids. He wants to steal your hopes your peace, your joy, he'll take anything that you won't fight for. The Bible said very clearly, Jesus said, I'm giving you keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in the heavenlies. It's bound in the spirit realm, but you've got to bind it on earth. If you don't attack the devil, he'll attack you. You just try to be a nice guy. I grew up in a church, my mom and dad were a little bit afraid of the devil, so they just their idea was just leave him alone. Don't talk about him. Maybe he'll leave us alone. No, that won't work. The devil hates you whether you know it or not. He's going to attack you whether you attack him or not. But you find out who you are in Jesus. You, let, let me tell you something. If you're seven feet tall and you got big hops and you can go up and dunk on anybody you want to, anytime you want to, playing ball is really fun. But if you're a little fat white kid and you can't dribble and you can't shoot, playing ball, getting dunked on ain't that much fun, right? <laughs> Christianity is awesome fun when you're kicking the devil out of your life every day and eating his lunch. But when he's eating yours, it's miserable. And you got to decide which category you're in. And the good news is you do get to decide. That is not God's choice. That is your choice. Do you believe God? Jesus said, I'm looking over the earth. Can I find somebody that believes I'm awesome don't take no stuff off the devil loving God. Does anybody believe, can I find somebody who will not fear, who will not doubt when the devil tries to scare them? You know, the Bible says fear has torment. And the good news about fear is it's, you can feel it sometimes, but it's not a feeling. Fear is not an emotion. God said, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Now listen, please, please. I'm going fast because time is short. I only get one shot at you. He gets to talk to you every week, you know. I got one shot at you for about a year. Maybe I'll get to come back. And, and But in the meantime, I got to talk to you about something that's somebody in this room, this is life or death for, or God wouldn't have me talking about it. God don't play church. And by the way, I don't either. This is serious business to me. We're in the life-saving business. Somebody here is going to be challenged. There's going to be a test. And you're going to have to decide whether you believe God or not. It's going to look like it ain't going to work for you because the God of this world is going to set up the perfect storm, and it's going to look bad. People, and sometimes even your own kin folks, just tell you, oh, oh, you know, just get ready to die. Just do what the doctors tell you. No, man, don't you do You fight the fight of faith. You fight the fight of faith. Now, let me, let me remind you, the fight of faith is never against people. We're not in battle against flesh and blood. The fight of faith is always against great powers and principalities in the unseen world, rulers of darkness. For instance, if, if the doctor says you're sick and you're going to die, you're not fight. It, the doctor's told me, uh, I had cancer just recently and you know you know they find what they find they, they believe what they believe they believe the facts because this doctor I'm talking about was not a Christian uh, I got sent to him by somebody else and it, it all happened sort of fast and you know so they said well you got well, the, the facts are it doesn't matter whether I had or have cancer the, the truth is, by his stripes I was healed. Now, here's what, 
since I know that God is honest and I know he's good and I know he loves me man I'm 75 years old I've been all over the world a bunch of times I was a millionaire before most of y'all were born I mean I've seen a whole lot of stuff and then I met God I ain't talking about Elvis I'm talking about, I ain't talking about Michael Jackson I'm talking about God and he hangs out with me every day and I get to watch how he does stuff and he talks to me every time I open up that book. That's his words. And his spirit who lives in me makes them come alive. And the excitement and the joy of being on a faith adventure. He, he told me to start a TV show. Well, you know, look at me. I'm a, I'm a preacher. M most preachers won't have me in their church. I need a haircut. <laughs> you know, I don't do suits and ties. I, I don't do religion. So I look at things a little different. In my Christian TV show, I'll just be honest with you. I started to tell you this earlier. It would offend somebody. Some Christians would get offended, but I'm going to say this to you, and I hope I pray that you won't. It's a rock and roll Bible study. It's what you would do. if It's made for unsaved and unchurched people. Now, Christians watch it, and they get built up and disciple because it's the Word of God, and we're helping them to understand it. But we're also trying to have more fun than any other Christian. We're out there on our motorcycles, and we're going to the coolest places in the world, and we're having so much fun, and tons of people are getting born again. I mean, it's amazing. But I was 73 when the Lord opened the door. Brother Copeland called me and said, you know, I believe God told me you're supposed to be on this network he offered me free time he paid for some of my airtime. that's 12 million dollars a year and he ain't charging me nothing and so when I prayed about it, am I supposed to do this Lord the Lord said well the devil didn't offer you free time <laughs> I said well what am I supposed to do here I don't know nothing about being on TV I don't have any cameras I don't have a crew I don't know how to do a show I don't know he said yeah that's right but I'm God and you know me. If you know him, you, you're, you're cool. Amen. It's just one day at a time. All I got to do is what he tells me today. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. So we borrowed some cameras. We started in the backyard. And all, all I'm trying to tell you is that you can do anything. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And if you make a mistake and it looks bad... If you really believe that all things work together for your good because you love the Lord and you've answered the call according to his purpose, then, you, you know, that's cool. You made a mistake. Duh, who doesn't? Right? It's working for my good. It's working for your good if you believe it and say it and expect it. Amen. Now, living by faith, well, I'm almost out of time. Let me turn, please, to. Um, let me turn, please, to Psalm 103. And if they'll put that scripture up for me, you know Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, "Without faith, it's impossible to please God." And then he said this: "For he who comes to God must believe two things: first of all, that God is God." And secondly, that God is a rewarder, a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's you. How many of y'all are seeking the Lord? You, you didn't come here just because it's Sunday. You came here to seek the Lord. You're willing to change for him. Is that true? Yes. Every day, I know I need to change. I know ho he's holy and I'm mild. So the reason I read the word every day, well, I mean, our whole TV show, many years ago, me and a guy named Alvin Lee made a record called On the Road to Freedom, 1972, I think. I was traveling with 10 years after, and Alvin was a guitar player. And, and uh, we got some friends. Woody, uh, uh, Ronnie Woods had been with Rod Stewart and the Faces, but he had just joined the Stones, and they weren't touring, so he played on the record. Mick Fleetwood, uh, George Harrison played on the record, the Beatles guitar player. And our drummer, Ian Wallace, was in a band called King Crimson. And in the middle of the album, King Crimson had to go on the road. So we needed a drummer. And so uh, George said, well, my brother-in-law's a drummer. And, and so I said, well, bring him to the session tonight because the tour 
happened quick and and Ian had to leave and so I told Alvin I said George's brother-in-law is going to set in tonight on drums until we find another drummer and Alvin said well who's his bro you know what if the guy's no good it was Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac he's a good drummer and uh Boz Burrell from Bad Company was our bass player. The keyboard player in that band was Steve Winwood from Traffic. Any of y'all remember any of these bands? Some of y'all look at me like Bill Clinton, like you didn't inhale. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Record was called On the Road to Freedom. Now, I didn't know a whole much about freedom, and I didn't know a whole lot about the Lord but I was trying to figure it out and now I do and here's what Jesus said if you continue in my word you'll know the truth and that's what the show's about just continuing in the word of God we're going to study it every day we're going to do it at our house we do exactly the same thing on TV that we do at our house when nobody's looking we get up every day we don't get up early I'm used to coming off the stage at 11 o'clock with a whole lot of Adrenaline, and I don't go to sleep early, you know, and I don't get up early except on Sunday. And so usually I jump out of the bed about the crack of 11, you know, <laughs> something like that, noon if possible. But, you know, the road to freedom is about continuing in the Word of God. He said, if you do that, you'll be my disciples. You'll, you'll know how to follow me. That's what a disciple is, a follower of Jesus. And he said, then you'll be free. It'll make you free. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, how bad do you want to know the truth? Because some people want to know the truth just enough to, for an hour on Sunday. And some people come on Wednesday night. But the ones who really want to know, they're in that Bible every morning. They're not telling their kids they need to read the Bible. Their kids are watching them read it every day. They're not telling their wife, you need to change, you need to read the Bible, you need to do what God said. They're reading it to her and praying it over her. I didn't even get one amen on that. And boy, I'm telling you, I'm, come on now, we're in this thing together. Amen? I was... I'm going to admit something, y'all. Pastor, can I have an extra 10 minutes? I wanna. I don't want to keep y'all late, or, but I, I just feel that I'm supposed to say what I'm about to say. In the 60s, I was born in 1944, and in the 50s, uh, I started writing songs. I have no idea why. It was just I dreamed music, and and I I can't tell you why I wrote songs. I was always amazed why everybody else didn't. You know what I mean? I'd be sitting there in biology. I hated biology. I just remember there were certain classes. My daddy made me take Latin. Do you know how many people speak Latin? More people speak pig Latin. You know what I mean? I hated it. Amoa masa manus. I mean, true. Anyway, I, I would be in, in biology. I remember in the 10th grade, they made us cut up a dead frog and right underneath all of its internal organs, its guts, what it what oh stinking formaldehyde frog, and I was thinking, who thinks of this stuff? Who do, who tortures kids? I mean, it's a it's a cruel human being who came up with I don't know. Anyway, that was I. So I'd be sitting there writing. I'd be hearing melodies, and I'd be I knew what the drums were supposed to do, and I could hear the bass lines, man, and. And uh, I, I went into, I, I didn't know how to play piano. So my daddy had a guitar, so that was my first act. So I learned to, to write on a guitar. And so I think I was maybe, in 1957, I was 13. And in the 50s in Georgia, I, I was raised right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, it was segregated in those days which meant that you you know schools were white or black uh, churches were white or black so if you were white or black you didn't get to hang out with everybody that wasn't like you because you never really knew what they were like because you didn't get to hang out with them 
and until I was in the army I mean that was the first time I really had a lot of black friends but previous to that radio was black or white so if you liked music and I liked music I'd be flipping in those days you went to radio you had to turn the dial whoop, 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 and it'd make all these funny sounds you finally get on the channel you go to the left it'd be a little bit more bassy and if you went too far to the right it'd be real thin and you know so I'd get that baby tuned in real good well there was black and white radio you you had a choice of uh, for instance at that time little Richard had just come along and little Richard's from Georgia so me you know he got played around the town where I live so if you were listening to the radio little Richard come on he'd be like doing long tall Sally or uh, you know uh, I can't remember all his songs he, he sung on one of my records he's anyway but he wouldn't get any money I mean there's not that many he didn't sell many records but then Pat Boone would record his songs Pat Boone's a white guy he wore these white buck shoes Pat loves the Lord good guy you know but if you listen to little Richard sing Long Tall Sally and you listen to Pat Boone sing Long Tall Sally I'm sorry Pat <laughs> come on you can hear one but you can feel the other one and, and, and by the way, he did that with four of Little Richard's songs. He went to number one with four of Richard's songs. Little Richard didn't make any money. He didn't get any, you know. But he wrote those songs, and boy, he played them. When he started playing that piano, something started happening in here. So I wanted to write music and share music that you could hear and feel. But there was some racism going on. And it was a very subtle thing in the church I was in. But they wasn't having, uh, I don't care if you're a white boy, they wasn't having you coming in there with that guitar and playing in that syncopated music. They called it the devil's music. Listen, music ain't black or white. It's just good or bad. Come on. It's not, music is not evil because of any other reason other than the heart of the person making it. Music can be good if your heart's pure, you know, and God anoints certain kinds of music, but it has nothing to do with the style of the music. It has to do with the hearts of the people making it and the lyric, of course, what it said. So I grew up, and they wouldn't have any of that. So I, had two, I only had two choices, stay here in the church where they tell me I'm making the devil's music or go out in the world where, where they will make me rich and treat me like a hero and flick their bicks every night and stand up for me and, and let me ride in limousines and Learjets and you know what I mean? And years later, of course, that about killed me. That was a bad choice. And years later, I got born again and, and the only job I got offered in the kingdom of God was a janitor at my church. So I quit making you know eight or ten grand a day in those days that was more than it's worth today it's still a lot of money but I mean in those days that was a lot of money and I I got a job being a toilet bowl cleaner in the gym behind the church for $175 a week and of course when you go from making a whole lot of money to your cash flow stops they start come get the place at the beach and they come get the Ferrari and the Porsche and, the, and it's just a matter of time they come get it all and Valerie and, and Bill, Valerie, wave your hand. They're from Atlanta. They came. Uh, it, her husband is a uh, NBA chaplain, and so we got to do some chapel services for the Atlanta Hawks for years. And but back in those days, that was my whole life. I mean, I cut my hair off. I did everything I knew to be. Uh, and I won't tell you who, but at that time, there was a really big preacher on TV. And he was the biggest preacher in the world at that time. And uh, he decided because I had long hair and that my band had, we had uh, 360,000 watts of uh, computerized lighting and, and we had pyrotechnics and we were having a whole lot of fun serving God. And, and, uh, but he decided that that was not anointed. And he came after us. And one of the things he said on TV, I, I used to watch him on TV and I learned a lot from him, by the way. And, and I love that brother, but he was, he was always rallying against the Catholics or against somebody. You know, the Bible says that we're supposed to lift up Jesus, not find fault with each other. 
And so anyway, the bottom line is he was coming after contemporary Christian people. And I used to, I don't have to wear glasses anymore. You know, the Bible, I, I, I quoted for years, when I'm old, my eyes will see. Well, now they see better. But at that time, I had to wear glasses for one to watch TV. And I'd just come back off the road, and I, I was turned on this guy, and it was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I was unpacking. We'd just come back off tour. And uh, I drove the last shift of the bus in from Seattle back to Atlanta. And so I was still up. And I, he said, he held up a magazine. He says, doth not nature itself. That's the beginning of a scripture. But then he changed it. He took it out of context. He said, doth not nature itself tell you that this man has a homosexual spirit? And I'd been listening. He'd been talking about contemporary Christian music and how it wasn't right and everything. I went and got my glasses. I thought, I know everybody in Christian music. I got to find out who this is. It was me. It was a, uh, we'd been on the front of a magazine that month. And I thought, uh, I, I learned a lot about forgiveness that day. You know, the Bible says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And uh, I went to my pastor the next day. I said, you know, this guy accused me. And I said, you know, I thought he was a prophet of God, but I now know he's not because he could have accused me of a lot of stuff, and at one time I would have been guilty of all that, but not that. That's not, that's not the truth. And you'd rather, you know, if somebody just told 150, 200 million people something, you'd rather them not think that about you. You know, uh, brother, my pastor said, hey, you're either going to do what God said or you're going to do what you want to. And what are you going to do? You claim you're a Christian? Are you going to give this to God? And here's what Jesus said. Be anxious for nothing. That means don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything make your request known unto God. And I'll take care of it, basically, is what God said. He said in another place, he said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due season he may exhaust you. And here's how you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting all your care on him or he cares for you. In other words, if you don't try to take care of this yourself, Mylon, God's going to take care of this. And he did. And at the end of that year, after all the persecution, we never said anything about this brother other than we love him and we're praying for him. We had a little band, and we weren't that well known. By the end of that year, we, we were number one in sales and number one in air flight. And all the persecution, all it did was work for our good. We led more people to Jesus the following year than we ever had in all the years previous put together. So God, in the test, you can get promoted or you can fail the test and take it again next year. That's the only two choices. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And he starts listing the benefits. He forgives all our sins or our iniquities. He heals all your diseases. Can we put that up, Psalm 103, verse 3, please? He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your sins. Uh, your, I'm sorry, your diseases. Say this with me. God forgives all my sins and he heals all my diseases. Now, if you live long enough, you'll be tested on this. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of when. Or somebody you love already has been or will be. Could be your child. Could be your wife. Bobby was the only one standing there when his heart stopped by herself. That little girl right there but she knew she wasn't just a little girl. She was God's daughter. And she grabbed a hold of God, and she grabbed a hold of her husband, and she hung in there, and she refused to give up. And you see pastors right here with us. But somebody had to do something. Somebody had to, yeah. When the devil attacks, you got to be the one. It goes on to say, he redeems your life from destruction. Verse 4. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies 
your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed. When they told me I had cancer, look, my youth is renewed. And I didn't have cancer when I was in my youth. And I ain't going to have it when I'm old either. With long, Here's what Psalm 91 says. With long life, God will show me his salvation. 75 ain't long life, y'all. I'm just getting warmed up. Amen. We got stuff to do. Jesus is coming. We got important things. And I'm no, God's no respecter of persons. You're just as important as anybody else. You're as important as Billy Graham to God. You have a place in the kingdom and you have a job in the kingdom and we can't do your job and you can't do mine. But together we can get this job done. And praise God we're gonna. Amen. We are gonna. We ain't quitting. We ain't giving up. We ain't backing down. Amen. We're gonna get this job done. So, amen. I'm done, and I'm going to quit, but I want to pray for you before I go. I'm going to ask Pastor to come up here and help me. I got one last scripture I'm going to quote to you. Remember, the fight of faith is always against the spirit of fear. This is John 6, and I didn't give this to the guys up there, so maybe you can put this up. John 6, 28 and 29. Maybe they can put this up, but I just want to read it to you right quick. I didn't send it, so that's my fault. The Lord just said this to me, so I didn't have time to send it to him. We want to perform. This is what they said to Jesus. We want to perform the, God's works too. What should we do? In verse 29, Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Faith is big to God. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He knows you're going to make mistakes. He's going to take care of you just like you take care of your kids. He's going to help you through it. He's going to, it's a teaching moment. He's going to help you. There's no condemnation for any mistakes you've made. As long as you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But we do have to confess them. Not to anybody else, but we have to confess them to God. We have to humble ourselves. What he does want us to do is believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. I know you want to please him. But you got to believe him. It doesn't do any good to believe him right now in church. You're going to have to believe him when the devil attacks you and all hell breaks loose. That's when the test is happening. When it looks impossible and it feels impossible and people tell you it's impossible, it's not. You just remember what happened to Eve? He's a liar. Satan is a liar. The God of this world is doing everything he can to convince you every day it won't work for you. He's trying to tell you, you give your money to the work of the kingdom and we go off to China or Russia or, or the prison or someplace and get somebody saved, that you're just getting ripped off. That's a lie to hell. You cannot bring the tithe into the storehouse and not have the windows of heaven open over you if you believe it. Don't stop believing just because it didn't work yet. The only way to pass the test is you never stop believing. You never stop. If they say they're laying them off at the factory and you're and everybody's getting laid off and you're you're going in there and oh my God, if you think you're going to get laid off, you are. But if you think, man, this is so cool, they're about to lay the boss off. I'm getting his job. <laughs> That's faith. Amen? The problem is an opportunity for God to turn it all around, reverse the curse, just for you. Do you believe he loves you that much? Because he does. He loves you, man. God is in, God is love. He ain't trying. He's not his motive or his intention. He's it. He's the whole thing. And love's what causes your faith to work. Well, man, I want to pray for you. Will you bow your head right quick? And uh, you can leave the lights on, guys, if you want to. It's up to you. But I, I want you to close your eyes. I, and I'm asking you to do this so that everybody around you has some privacy. Just for one minute, please, would you all close your eyes and bow your heads? And I just want to say this. Pastor and I want to join our faith with yours. 
and we don't have small faith we have a lot of it and sometimes it you need help I do there's times when one can put a thousand to fly but two can put ten thousand to fly if you're here today and you know that you've been living in fear and worry and doubt and unbelief and you want to start living by faith in the son of God you need to give him your life and I don't mean just your problems it's good to give him the stuff you're ashamed of that you're failing at but it's even better to give him your whole life and if you've never done that just I'm asking you just humble yourself and slip your hand up nobody's looking but God and me and pastor just slip your hand up and say I need prayer I need God's help glory to God honey glory to God my brother yes ma'am yes sir excellent decision In it, praise God amen hallelujah Jesus anybody else glory to God in the highest excellent sir amen yes sir amen yes my brother what an honor that we get to join our faith of yours yes ma'am anybody else you're just saying here I am I humble myself I know I've, I've sinned I know I've fallen short of the glory of God and I want to get it right and live for Jesus from this day forward anybody else one last time glory to God sir excellent decision hallelujah will you all pray this please everybody pray this with me please out loud Father God I come to you this morning in the name of Jesus Father I turn from my sins I accept responsibility for my choices my mistakes please forgive me sir thank you for cleansing me from all unrighteousness thank you for loving me and proving it today thank you Lord for helping me for giving me your mercy your patience your grace Lord I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit permeate my life and I'll be very careful to give you all the glory and all the honor until I see you face to face in Jesus name hallelujah